We're here to talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers in today's podcast. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today, Cleveland Cavaliers time because they are a team that... uh, is a weird one. There's a, a lot to think about with the Cavs. There's a lot to talk about with the Cavs. There is almost as many unknowns with this team as there is with any team in the NBA at the moment. And that does make it yeah, quite a challenge at times to try and figure out what actually is going on with this squad. So first of all, I'm going to answer questions that you guys sent through. Again, you can always send those questions through. Check out my Instagram stories, Locked on Fantasy Basketball, or there'll be a tweet that goes out. Tomorrow we'll be doing the Atlanta Hawks. So be on the lookout to submit your Atlanta Hawks questions. For the Cavs, A. Correa says, what's the overall under on Kevin Love playing 80% of the season? Well, Kevin Love played 56 games this year. So he wasn't far off 80%, 56 out of what, 65 games that they played, I reckon that's uh, that's a bit over 80%, to be honest. Now he's going to be 30, well, he's just turned 32. So you know, he's going to have a chance. I would say, if I had to guess under, which is 65 games, I'd say I'd probably take the under on Love. But I think that it can be a little bit overblown. And as I said, he played 56 games this year which was one fewer than Andre Drummond, one the same as Larry Nance, one fewer than Tristan Thompson, three fewer than Darius Garland, more than Kevin Porter Jr. So it wasn't like he was just missing tons and tons of games. Zach Adams says, will the Cavs return to the playoffs in the next 10 years? Well, that's a long time. Um, but man, things look pretty rough. I'll say yes, just because yeah, there is, unless you're the Kings, really, then you can get back in 10 years, or the Timberwolves. Um but man, it, it looks pretty rough at the moment. Dave Rumps says, is Drummond a dinosaur? Is he going to be an afterthought this year? And this is almost the biggest question on this entire team, is what the hell is Andre Drummond? He has a player option, which is large, and he's already said he's going to be picking that up. It's $29 million. There's talk that they might look to re-sign him after they gave up nothing for him in a trade. But the confusing part is that when Andre Drummond came across in the trade, they barely played him. They played him six games out of the 11 that they had. He played under 29 minutes a game. And he was disappointing, really disappointing in that time. What is his role with Kevin Love and Larry Nance there? Tristan Thompson is an unrestricted free agent, so he might not be back. Could they pick a center in the draft? I I, I really don't know what to make of not only what Andre Drummond is, but what Cleveland thinks Andre Drummond is, because that's probably the most important part of it. We know that they're not looking for a new head coach. JB Bickerstaff is there. So he's their coach for now, and he didn't like using Drummond big amounts. Simple as that. So I don't, re- I don't think he's a complete dinosaur. I-, I tell you what, I do know is Andre Drummond is definitely not a defensive player of the year, as Greg Logan voted. He is not an all-defensive team guy because he got gets steals and gets rebounds. He is a bad defender who puts up defensive numbers. They are very different things. And for fantasy, that works great because those numbers are fantastic. And he was the 15th ranked player, sorry, 16th ranked player this season. But in his time in Cleveland, he was outside the top 50. Um, He was in and out of the lineup. He played, to be fair to Drummond and to be fair to Cleveland, the last three games that he played, 36, 33, and 35 minutes. And the numbers were big, 27 and 13, 28 and 17, 21 and 7. So I reckon my lean towards it is that they will go back to giving him big minutes. Thompson won't be around. They won't be trying to placate him. Those first games where he came across, 29, 22, 22, 25, 24 minutes. Some really poor performances in those ones from Drummond. Um, But then, yeah, set out a couple and and came back. I think that he'll be okay um, this season, and I'm not expecting that outside top 50 finish. That's a lot of chalk on Drummond because I'm going to talk about more more about him later. Brazan says, does Colin Sexton have breakout potential? I'd say he almost broke out a little bit this year. He averaged 21 points a game. And 
I've shit on Colin Sexton a lot because I think he's significantly overhyped. But what he did do this year was he was able to score in really large volume and do it really efficiently. And that is super impressive. And he was very good there. Now, he is still an atrocious defender and he is still a bad passer. But being a bad passer is orders of magnitude better than where he was, where he was a horrendous passer. He has improved significantly in his passing. And again, big credit goes to him there. Now, he improved, but... Post trade deadline, he averaged four assists. Like he is not a good distributor. He is uh, getting better as a distributor. I don't ever think he's going to be good at that. And defensively, I just I don't know what the hell to expect from Colin Sexton. But to be fair, he got a steal a game, which is not the best, but it's not terrible. And he did improve. I still don't like him as a guy that you'd want as your point guard or leading scoring guard on a good team, but this Cavs team is not a good team, so he's going to get lots of opportunities. He is still only 21 years of age, so I think he can perhaps improve. If he keeps up the 21 points per game, the 56% true shooting that he did this season, and then goes from three assists to four assists, and instead of one and a half threes, because that's a problem. He shot threes well, but didn't shoot enough of them. But if he takes that from one and a half to two and a half, then yeah, he's an easy top 50 type player. So there is some real potential there for Sexton, despite me not particularly thinking he's a great winning basketball type of guy. Um, um, doo -doo -doo, what else are we seeing? Uh, Michael Bowles, 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 Bowlesy. Uh, I keep seeing, seeing Dylan Windler drafted in the 150 to 300 range in Dynasty. I don't see the return on investment. Are they crazy or me? Well, that's a massive range. Mick, because 150 is crazy for Dylan Windler. 300 is totally fine. Remember, Dylan Windler was a pick at the end of the first round this year who didn't play a game. In fact, he played just two games in the G League, and he averaged six points in those games, shooting 29% from three. But what he was able to do in college is be a really high-level rebounder, a smart defender, a very good shooter, uh, and a, cap yes, a, capable, a player capable of getting some defensive numbers. At 300, I wouldn't yeah, pick 300. I would have no problem in selecting Dylan Winlow there. At 150, I think the upside there is pretty low. But he is, um, I think he's an interesting player because we just didn't see him play at all this year. So I really would like to see him involved in this rotation. Um, you know, long term, you'd hope that he can step up and fill in the Larry Nance, Kevin Love type of role there at Power Forward. It's still years away, you know, three, four years away, but at least he's a name that if he's falling to 300, then yeah, because no one saw him play, there is a little bit of value there in him. Grant Dykeman says, how high are we going with Kevin Porter Jr. next season? This is a really interesting one as well, because Porter... Um, I had some really strong moments this year, and then multiple injuries sort of ruined what we thought might be a bit of a breakout. The post-All-Star stuff where his minutes went up, his shooting went way down, just 11 points on 37% shooting, but he showed an ability to pass. 3.3 assists, we got a steal a game. He hit 1.33s. His free throw percentage was much better than what it was during his time at USC, where it was a weirdly at like 50%. He was up to 72. Uh, I worry a little bit about his lack of peripherals, but I think he can be... If he ends up a better player than Darius Garland, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't really know where he fits this year. I'd love to see them give him an opportunity at the three and see where he goes from there. But it was an encouraging-ish type season from Kevin Porter, but I would be hesitant to draft him in the top 100. To me, he's a guy that you look at you know, as, as a last pick, a, a last couple of selection type uh, situation for, uh, for big Kev Porter. All right, that is all the questions that came through there on the old Insta. If we have a look at the questions on Twitter that came through talking or taking Trout, sorry, did they trade Kevin Love? I, I'm sure they'd love to. Who's taking him? Yeah, Kevin Love is 32, as I said already. He has um, a lot of money left on his contract. And not, not only that, in a situation where so many teams are pushed up against the cap and the cap potentially coming down, Yo, you have to send matching salaries back. Love is owed 31 million next season, 31 million the year after, 29 million the year after that. So three years left at basically $90 million. It's a lot. And who is trading for that? So uh, while they would love to trade Kevin Love, I just don't think that's going to happen. How do Thompson and Drummond coexist? Well, they don't necessarily have to coexist because Tristan Thompson might not be there. So that's uh, that's our question there. Um, all right, let's have a look. Uh, Kaleo, how long is Drummond going to be great in fantasy? That, that's an interesting question because I think he can still be pretty good next season. I reckon that could be the start of the decline though for him. And I, I would be looking to bail out in dynasty type situations. I reckon next year is probably it for him before uh, as a top 20, top 25 guy. And then it goes to top 50, then top 70 after that. 
Matt Lawson, again, NBA Dynasty ADP. Really follow this guy if you're in a Dynasty League. Which, if any of these Cavs Dynasty ADPs are you buying or selling? Drummond at 40. I reckon that's fair. Sexton at 86. I'll buy that. Kevin Love at 104.5. This shows you that if you're doing a start startup Dynasty draft, that if you're looking to compete in year one or two, you can get value. Kevin Love at 104 is value. Kevin Porter at 107.8. I reckon that's on the money. Uh, Darius Garland at 112.8. Well, he was shit for. And I reckon that there's... Even though it's only 112, I reckon there's some boom or bust potential there in Garland. I'm not sold on it. Nance at 156.5. I'd buy that for a couple of years. Osman at 174. I reckon his run at even being a top 200 guy is cooked. Thompson at 207. Absolutely no interest whatsoever. And Windler at 276.7. I reckon that's okay. Um, Jesus Walker, not his real name, maybe. Can Porter Jr. play the three? The interesting thing about Porter Jr., and irrespective of his play, is that there are three players in the NBA whose surname is Porter, and all of them are juniors. Kevin Porter Jr., Michael Porter Jr., Otto Porter Jr. I know it means absolutely jack shit, but it's interesting. Can he play the three? Yeah, look, he did play the three this year. Can he do it consistently and defend up to bigger wings? Probably not. But on a shit team, uh, in a pinch, yeah, no, no problem. Will Osman have another chance, or will they draft a guy like Devin Vassell? I think they should draft a guy like Devin Vassell at pick number five. That's uh, how, how I'd like them to approach this draft and, and get a wing like that who can play defense and can be a really good shooter. And yeah, ideally, I, I think one of Sexton or Garland isn't going to work out. So you can run Sexton Garland, you can run Porter, and you can run uh, Vassell. But then you still got no distribution stats at all or distribution ability from any of those players. You just got guys who are great secondary or tertiary creators. Um, so that, that's a little bit of worry. They could also go with someone like Denny Abdia as a wing player there as well. So they do have quite a few options. Isaac Okora, another option they can bring in there too. So I think that will give him plenty of chances to play the three. I reckon the Osman run of being a starter is probably going to be done. Mike says, do you think they'll make an Eastern Conference Finals in the next seven years? Now, I said playoffs in 10 years. Sure, Eastern Conference Finals in seven, I'll say probably not. Uh, I don't think that's a, a likely scenario. I tell you what is a likely scenario, though, and that is finding a good deal at rockauto.com. Rockauto.com, when you're looking for parts for your car or truck, don't bother going into your local auto store because... Those guys, they're not going to have all the parts in stock because there are so many different types of parts for makes and models of cars that you might not have even heard of. Or maybe you have because you're a car nut, unlike me. But going into one of those stores, you sit there, the bloke types it out on his computer, and he goes, nah, mate, three or four weeks. And you go, well, I could have just done that myself. And now you can. Go to rockauto.com, type in, look for your parts, get those parts delivered directly to your door, and save money because auto stores, they have different pricing. They have the shifty side prices for professionals, and then they have a more expensive price for you do-it-yourselfers. At rockauto.com, that price is the same right across the board. So why would you waste time and spend more money by going into a local store? Go straight to rockauto.com, look up the parts that you need for your car or truck, place your order, and bang, you are happy. And when you're doing that, when you go to rockauto.com, in that section that says, how did you hear about us? Just write locked on in that box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Let's look at these Cavs players more now. Let's talk about Andre Drummond. As I said, he was the 16th ranked player this year. His PIPM was a positive. His true shooting was a little bit below average at 55%. He was a marginally negative Raptor player. He averaged 1.9 steals and 1.6 blocks, 18 points and 15 rebounds. Really good stuff there. 53% from the field is rough. 58% um, from the line. He's still a massive punt guy, despite the improvements that he made there. And then you contrast it again to what he did in Cleveland, and it was pretty poor to see those numbers drop off those 29 minutes. But to be fair to him, he still averaged 18 points a game in Cleveland with 10 rebounds. And that 10 rebounds, when you're playing alongside Kevin Love, can be an issue. And we might not see Drummond pulling in those monster rebound numbers next to Love, who's quite a good rebounder himself. But no reason he can't get the steals up at that same level or he shouldn't get them up. Um, his usage was at 28% in Cleveland, higher than it was in Detroit. So that's encouraging. Um... He is, as I've talked about already, he is a confusing one in terms of the way they used him. But those last three games perhaps give us a little bit more insight into how they're going to throw him out there. Give him 33 minutes a night, run a three-man front court with Love, Nance, and Drummond. Love and Nance are almost guaranteed to miss time during the season. So there's going to be even more minutes coming there. And I think he'll be all right for at least the next season. He's still got some pretty significant value. So don't get completely uh, turned off by what happened for Andre Drummond in his time in Cleveland, especially those first couple of games where shit was rough and it looked like they traded for him for God knows what reason because they weren't going to use him at all. Um, 
The next player we take a look at is the aforementioned Kevin Love, who uh, I think was a pretty strong bounce back player. The 48th ranked player over the course of the season. He averaged, uh, or he played 56 games and played 32 minutes a night. And considering where he came from uh, the year before, that was pretty uh, pretty good. Now, one thing I wasn't expecting is to him to have such a low usage, just 23% for 18 points with 10 rebounds. He hit two and a half threes. He had negligible, and by negligible, I mean absolutely nothing in terms of defensive numbers. And it was average to poor on his field goal percentage, but 85% from the line. He just didn't dominate the ball as I thought he was, but he was still pretty important in that area and beat his ADP at 52. I thought that he'd get more usage and be maybe a 20-point per game scorer. He was never going to go back to Minnesota, Kevin Love, but I thought he could be a bit better. So I guess I had some lofty expectations, but he exceeded my expectations in terms of how many games he played, just that the overall scoring production was down. He is 32 years of age. His Raptor was dead on zero. His PRPM was negative 0.08, so like a thoroughly average player. Where the hell does he go from here? I think that we can see a... I I would be stunned if he was a top 50 player next season, to be honest. I think that his um, value is going to start to decline pretty quickly from here on out, and he might have one top 100 season left, would be my guess here for Kevin Love at the age of 32. Next up is the Padawan. It is Colin Sexton, who at the age of 21 was the 84th ranked player. His advanced stats are still horrible. Negative 2.9 PIPM, negative 3.3 Raptor. 56 true shooting is, is okay. Usage 27, really good. And that's a good combination there. But the troubling thing is just how bad those advanced numbers are. Now, those advanced numbers are, you can write them off as much as you want, but they take so many things into account. It is you know, things like plus minus, how impactful you are when you're on the court. Luck adjusted plus minus for PIPM. Raptor takes into consideration the quality of shots that you're generating for your teammates, where those shots are coming. If Not even just if they're hitting those shots, but are they wide open looks? And all that stuff is factoring in negatively in Sexton's value because he is a bad passer. He is a bad defender. They are two things that are unquestionable about Colin Sexton. He is a very, very good scorer at the moment. He is putting up massive scoring numbers and he's doing it super efficiently. He needs more three-point attempts to shoot just... um, What's he at? Only 24% of his shots coming from three and he's a 38% three-point shooter. That is rough. That is something where you go, well, how real is that three-point shooting? It means, is he only taking wide open ones? Because uh, he's just not getting that volume up. I'd like to see that improve. If it can, he can become a 25-point per game scorer. But the worry is, is there's low volume threes, rebounds, assists, and steals, and doesn't block any shots. That is all the concern as to how he actually extends further. Can he be better next season? Sure. I think we can see a volume increase. I think we can see, as I mentioned earlier, that that ability to make passes did improve as the season went on. And if if that's able to continue, then that is something that's worth looking at with Sexton. I'm still not buying him as a guy that you want to pencil in as a 10-year starter and you want as your point guard. I think his value... And this is a, one of those problems. His value is probably best as a shooting guard, but he's very small and he can't defend twos and he can't defend one. So where does he fit? He's not out there distributing and he's not out there being a real three-point scoring threat. Good scoring threat, but on a team that when it becomes better, where does where does he fit when better players are around him? Because that's sort of the big worry that I have there with Sexton. So I think for the next couple of years, sure, there is some real value that he can put up. But those advanced numbers are horrible indicators for his future. And I would be really couching my value. I wouldn't be looking at him as a top 30 guy or anything like that. And that's why when I talked about that Dynasty ADP, look, he's came in pretty strong. I would, I would buy that. But getting to that upper level of value, I'm, I'm not really sure that he gets there. Let's talk about Larry Nance, who is always a real fantasy gem. 105th ranked player in only 26 minutes a night. If he plays 30, he's a top 60 guy. There's almost no doubting that. Only 10 points and 7 rebounds. He had 1 steal and 0.4 blocks. And normally, he's much better on those defensive stats. 53% from the field. He hit a 3 a game. He showed some passing chops as well. Um, Nance is going to be 28 really soon. Lots of injuries for him. Um, I'm a little bit worried about where he goes from here. The advanced stuff was a, was massive. Now, he has always been a huge, winning, positive, contributing player. 1.48 PIPM, 1.2 Raptor, 61 true shooting on low usage. He showed an ability to pass at a higher level. Uh, I just worry about, again, where he goes from here and what the Cavs want to do with him as a power forward center with love around. I think that 
I reckon he can have a top 60 season. I think that if Love is hurt or if Love is traded or if you know, Love just completely drops off, we might see more minutes for Nance. But it does feel like the Cavs are set on him being a 23 to 25 minute a night player. We saw him you know, massively dicked around early in the season and playing a historically, well, not historically, a ridiculously low amount of minutes when he was consistently one of the best players on the team. And that is always seeming to be the case with Nance, that no matter how well he plays, the coaches don't seem to recognize that. And that is not good for us from a fantasy point of view. So I wouldn't have too many high hopes on him. It is going to come down to what happens with Tomo, with Love, what they do with Drummond. There's a lot of question marks there, but Nance isn't as young as we think he is. He's, a, he's older than Drummond. And there is some, yeah, some concern that maybe that time could have passed him by. I think that's a possibility. Next up is Tristan Thompson, who played just way too much this season. And to be fair to Thompson, he started out the season really well. He was the 135th ranked player over the course of the year. The advanced stuff was bad, negative 2.2 PIPM, negative 1.3 Raptor, a poor true shooting percentage. He started out the season blocking shots at a really high level. And we said, well, this is amazing. Tristan Thompson's a top 100 player. He's a must-add guy. But this is a guy that's never blocked shots before. So the caution was always there. This is out of the blue, and it's really, really nice as it is. But don't really expect it to continue. In the end, he averaged under one block a game. He played 30 minutes a night. He averaged 12 and 10. He shot 51% from the field. And the season overall was eh, for Thompson. After the, the trade... Trade deadline, he played 27 minutes a night. He was the 261st ranked player. Like That is probably more in line with what to expect from him. I would be absolutely floored if he was a top 150 player again. Um, I would be floored if someone wanted to sign him to be their starter. Would the Cavs bring him back? If the Cavs bring him back, that front court's an absolute mess. And I don't know how the hell that's going to be figured out with Nance, Drummond, Love, and Thompson all there. I, I, despite his you know uh, value to this team, and historical importance and your legacy with the squad. He's 30 years of age, and he's the fourth best big man on the team. I'm not really sure where that puts him in terms of their plans. So that his unrestricted free agency is going to be really, really intriguing. And he is not someone that I would really bank on to have much fantasy value moving forward. Next up is Chetty Osman, 185th ranked player. He played 29 minutes, 11 points, two threes, three and a half boards, 44 and 67 with his percentages for a true shooting of just 55%. Bad ad uh, advance numbers, bad PIPM, huge negative there. Negative Raptor as well at negative 1.6. And I think the Chetty Osman as a starting wing experiment in the NBA is over. He's going to be 26 at some point next season, so he's not old by any stretch, but he's had these opportunities the last two seasons, and he has not grasped them. Uh, we thought he could be a guy that could get some decent scoring, could hit some threes, could pass a little bit, could defend, and none of those things have come true. He just hasn't been able to excel in the situation that he's been given, and I would be pretty surprised to see Chetty get to the top one, the top 200 like he was this season and for him to play 29 minutes. He's one of those guys that needs 33 minutes and for everything to go his way. He's had that chance. It hasn't worked out. I'm ready to move on and not expect that from him again. Darius Garland is a tough one because he was trash nearly all season. 205th ranked player. He's still only 20 years of age and realistically, it was his first time playing basketball in a long time because he played like those five college games and he had knee injuries this season as well. 31 minutes, 12 points with four assists. He hit 1.8 threes. He hit 88% from the line now, an absolutely horrible one attempt from the line a game, which is not good. 36% from three is okay. It's pretty good, in fact. In, uh, in five attempts, we need more of that to go up, but just watching him, it was hard to get too excited. His PIPM was horrible, negative 3.6, one of the worst 10 in the entire league, minus 6.5 Raptor is bad, under 50 true shooting is bad, uh, 21 usage is okay, but again, post All-Star, it was only six games, he played 35 minutes, he had 13, 2, and 4, which is a step forward. Now, is that an encouraging thing, or is that an indictment on how bad he was before? Those numbers are still not good. They made him the 156th ranked player in that time. He got 0.7 steals. And that's one of the big worries in him if coming out of college as well. This guy is absolutely stick skinny. He's got no strength. I don't think he's a good defender. He can't generate steals. Can he get assists? Is the shooting real from what we saw at Vanderbilt? All of those questions. I still don't know the answer. Actually, I do know the answer to one of them. He's not a good defender, and I'm not sure he's a good passer. So I don't really know where this leaves Garland from here. I'm a little bit concerned about his long-term appeal. He is a long way off his peak, obviously, 
I'm not sure his peak is all that high. Is his peak top 50? I'd say probably not at this point. Can he develop into a high-level starting point guard? Probably not. It's very, very early to say that, but the signs were not encouraging. I say all this saying, well, your situation was bad on a bad team with a bad coach next to a player like Sexton who can't set you up either. And you showed no ability to set you up as Darius Garland. Like He didn't do any of that either, so I'm not absolving him of blame. The shooting was encouraging. Attempts need to go up. We need to get to the line more. We need to see a lot more from him. So I'm not, by any means, not writing him off. But I think upper level point guard for him is probably out of the discussion. And let's see where he goes. I Again, having Garland and Sexton on my team as the Cavs would not preclude me from drafting a guard. If Killian Hayes or LaMelo Ball fell to me at pick five, I would snap them up immediately. And Killian Hayes is going to be available there from all indications that NBA teams aren't valuing him as highly as I am. I would take him at two, three, four, five, anywhere there. All right, but teams don't seem to value him that way. And if I was the Cavs, I wouldn't have no hesitation. But I think they will have hesitation, and they won't go that. They already you know, doubled down on Sexton by taking Garland again, and I think they'll go with three guards in a row. Although, again, I, if one of them is not going to work out, if two of them aren't going to work out, what the hell is the problem? We're taking another person in that position. I'm not all that convinced in where Garland lies in his career. Kevin Porter Jr., the 213th ranked player, his advanced stuff was pretty shit as well. Negative 4 Raptor, negative 2.4 PIPM, true shooting at 54%. I thought he was uh, impressive at times. He showed that ability to pass more than others. He can block some shots, interestingly, almost a block per game post-All-Star break. But the shooting numbers are a little bit worrying at times. 34% from three. Um, yeah, Overall, his two-point percentage wasn't great. His usage was okay. I worried that he was that player who was going to be flashy and going to come in with great highlight moves, and he's an unbelievable ISO player, but can he actually fit in a team? Can he defend? Can he pass? Can he work within a scheme and not be just an ISO ball hog? And I think he showed some degree of that, that yeah, allayed some of my fears that maybe he just wouldn't be good. Um, he wasn't fantastic, but he did show some uh, value. I think he's probably going to be a better player than Garland at, at this stage uh, with some value long-term. Now, do we want to rate him as a top 40, 50 guy? I'm not sure we go that high. I am pretty confident he can have multiple top 100 seasons, though, in the future. Um, it is going to be, come down to can you get some peripherals? What is it going to be? Is it going to be steals? Are you going to be able to get assists at a higher level? Are you going to be able to improve your rebounding? Because these re these guards are absolutely horrible. Sexton, Garland, Porter cannot rebound for the life of them. And I guess it helps that you've got Love and Drummond behind you to grab all those boards. But the rebounding numbers, Garland averaged 1.9 rebounds. I don't even know how that's possible. Sexton had three and Porter had three. Like these are very low rebound numbers and that is not going to be a strength of those guys. So Porter averaged three rebounds and two assists. Yeah, poor numbers, 10 points, one, three. That's why he's outside the top 200. But I do think that he can be a, a jump up sort of a player. Alfonso McKinney, we're getting down to the scraps of players now. McKinney played 40 games this year, 15 points, 15 minutes a game, four and a half points, uh, minus 1.06 PIPM, 49 true shooting. Uh, McKinney is 28 years of age. Uh, he had some moments for the Warriors at times uh, over his career. I just think that he's a guy that you throw around. He signs in 10 days for teams that are out of playoff races and just comes in and has some good moments, but I, I really don't see what we're talking about here with Alfonso McKinney moving forward. I don't see much value in him being a good player. Dante Exum, speaking of not being a good player, came across in the trade for Jordan Clarkson and really exploded in one game. Had the best game of his career, and then it was disappointing again. And that is the story of Dante Exum. Uh, Exum had an ankle injury that ended his season. He played um, just 35 games. He averaged four points. He shot 47% from the field for true shooting of 58%, which is actually okay for where Exum is. But you know, realistically, he came across. He played in that was his fifth game for the Cavs. He had 28 points. And then he followed it up by missing the next three and having a combined eight points in his next three games. If we go even further, he had 13 points combined in his next five games. He scored in double digits just twice after that in the two of the last three games before he was out for the season with that ankle injury. And I just don't think that Exum is ever going to be a positive contributor on an NBA court, and definitely not from a fantasy point of view. Now, the dude's still 25 years of age. He's been around forever. ACL injuries, shoulder injuries, ankle injuries. He's had so many different injuries that have really perhaps ruined his career. But he was also that player that looked like he could be a really strong defender without putting up good fantasy numbers. And that's exactly what he's been so far. And now with all the injuries, even the defensive stuff is waning a little bit from, uh, from Dante. 
And I'm not really sure where he goes from here. Negative 1.8 PIPM, negative 1.5 Raptor. Wouldn't be look. You've got Sexton, Garland, Porter. They're all ahead of him in that rotation. Wouldn't be surprised to see him not even be a regular rotation player uh, for this team next season. He could be, but I wouldn't be surprised if he isn't. Ante Zizic, a guy that I thought could be an impact-ish backup big in the NBA. He's gone back to Europe, so we don't have to worry about him too much. But yeah, he was a guy that's a, an efficient scorer. Uh, but just couldn't put up any defensive numbers and just got cooked every time he was on the court, pretty much. So he's gone. Manny Dellavedova is an unrestricted free agent. He was a 399th ranked player. Actually had really positive PIPM and Raptor numbers despite not being able to shoot anymore. 23% from three. True shooting of just 46%. Usage of uh, 13%, but what he was able to do is play passable defense, but most importantly, he can pass, and no one else on this team really can. So when he was out there, and if he started, he was able to pass and be a sneaky, weird stream option for assists. I think that they there's a chance they bring him back. He's 30 years of age, veteran minimum salary. He doesn't play every night, but he can come in and at least per, contribute as a ball distributor, as someone who can set up an offense. There's not many of those guys on this team. But Dally has been a Cavs legend. We know that. And whether he is a fantasy, actually, he's never going to be a fantasy impact guy again. But what again, what he can do is if there's injuries and they go, well, Dally over starting tonight, he can have six or seven assists. He could also have six points, but you could have six or seven assists. That is where he is at in his career at this point. Next up is Jordan Bell, who did end up on this Cavs team somehow. Um, Bell was all over the shop in terms of where he was during the year. He went to Memphis. He was in Minnesota. He was in um, uh, Houston for a bit, and he ended up in Cleveland. He didn't end up playing any games in Cleveland, but they did sign him there. Uh, I was always big on Jordan Bell as a player who had this great archetype, a high-efficiency steals and blocks guy who can pass a bit. I'm done. He's almost 26 years of age. He's showing no signs of maturity. Um... The advanced stuff is still okay for him. I just don't, especially on this team, why would you be investing in Jordan Bell ahead of the guys that, that are there? You know, Drummond, especially Nance, who's you know significantly better than him. I'm not sure he's ever going to get it figured out, Jordan Bell. So that was one that I screwed up. I thought he could have really high upside. He showed it in that first season, and then he's uh, off-field or off-court stuff caught up with him, and the coaching staff lost faith in him, and his play declined as well. So it was a, a real, uh, real hat-trick of terribleness. Next bloke, Dean Wade, the 442nd ranked player, Wadey, was um, he signed to a contract at the end of the season. He played 12 games. He averaged 1.7 points. He had a poor Raptor. His true shooting was 74%, which is yeah, obviously really good. What did he do in the G League, though? He averaged 14 and 8 there with 1.4 blocks, and he shot 40% from three. So he is a stretch big. He's a 6'9 power forward who can go out there and hit threes. He can block shots at an okay level. I don't think that he's the worst option to have around and try and develop. Oh, I could see him yeah, ahead of Jordan Bell pretty clearly. But yeah, being that interesting fifth big man that when Love moves on or Thompson's gone, you could see him at least filling a rotation role for a couple of years. He was yeah, marginally impressive during his time, I thought. Matt Mooney, the 446th ranked player. Mooney played just the four games this year. Didn't really do much in those games. Um, massive Raptor for some reason, plus 10.8. But that is really just small sample size stuff for Matty Mooney. In his year, uh, he averaged 13 points in the G League. He hit 36% of his threes, uh, two, two threes a game. He averaged five assists per game. He's a 6-2 guard. So getting some of those assists in there was sort of interesting for Mooney, but he is a uh, restricted free agent coming off his two-way deal, and I don't really see him being an impact guy. And we've already talked Dylan Windler. We have no numbers to go off of him apart from those two games that he did play in the G League. I think that he is going to be given an opportunity to compete for a rotation spot, but there's a chance that he is like that fifth or sixth, the big man. If they want to play him at the three, that's where the opening is with Porter and uh, Osman there. Um, they could give Winless some minutes, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him fill a 25-minute-a-night role in the last two months or so of the season. But at this point, we just don't know where Winler is as a second-year player who didn't play in his first season, so going to be a rookie, of course, next season. That'll do it for me talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers. Don't forget, guys, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.